Tech News Weekly is sponsored by Audible.com, the internet's leading provider of audiobooks, with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. And by Stitcher Radio. Listen on the go via the Stitcher mobile app. For more information, go to stitcher.com slash gfq. Starting Tech News Weekly in 3, 2, 1... Everybody, welcome to Tech News Weekly. I am Andrew Zarian, and this is your source for all things tech, everything that happened in technology. We will try to cover it in about an hour or less or a little more. We don't know yet. A little late start today if you're watching live, but uh, no sweat because it is a jam-packed show. First, I want to introduce uh, my co-host, uh, John Bub, also known as Suncast, notoriously on the internet. His name is Suncast. A.K.A. He harasses Notorious. people. He's been, known, he's been known as Scumcast. He's been known to go on Stick'em.com, <laughs> may it rest in peace, and uh, possibly get nude on there. Uh, are those rumors true, John? I cannot neither confirm nor deny. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I, I mean, I've heard some stuff. Uh, I mean, I, you, you are a little scary at times. You do have a shower curtain behind you. I mean, I know, I know your personal life, and there are things that shock me about your personal life where I sometimes think to myself... This will be the day that I am murdered. And you're one to talk? Oh, uh, don't even start with me. I'm a, I'm a freaking book. <laughs> this week, uh, guys, we have a special guest. I haven't seen uh, this guy for a while on the show, and it's Chase Nunez uh, from GeekGamer.tv. Uh, Minecraft Me, very popular show. Uh, iTunes ranked number one currently in the uh, gaming section. Uh, hey, Chase, how you doing? Happy New Year. Oh, I'm sorry. Happy New Year. Oh, uh, usually when you come on my show, you're always drinking some sort of tasty beverage. I couldn't <laughs> find one immediately, so I'm drinking a nice, healthy Sprite. Um, but I'm doing good. Huh. I'm doing very good. It's great, great to be here. I'm happy to be here, as uh, a friend of mine would say. And uh, I'm excited, and I'm stoked to be talking about tech news. And uh, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm actually uh, having a beverage, too, and I'm drinking out of a kitty cat mug today. Oh, how cute. I did have a couple drinks before the show. I'm not going to lie. Though. Awesome. I did go out and I get it loaded for lunch. Listen, That's it's right. always Friday here. Always That's Friday. Right. <laughs> In my life, it's always Friday. But uh, we are going to talk about technology. But before we do, I want to give a little plug out for everybody. If uh, you want to follow Chase on Twitter, it's at Nunez, N-U-N-E-S. Also, uh, Geek Gamer TV is on Twitter as well. Of course, there's a Facebook page on GeekGamer.tv is the website. You can watch Geek Gamer TV, Geek Gamer, uh, Geek Gamer Weekly. I always screw it up, Chase. I really do. I know. You can watch Geek Gamer Weekly every Sunday night at 9 p.m. East. And, of course, uh, Minecraft Me. What, what day does Minecraft Me air? Now, we typically do it on Thursday evenings, 9 uh, Pacific, 12 midnight Eastern. However, uh, we're making the move to HD. Ooh. And so yesterday was a technical preview. We're actually doing Minecraft Me tonight at 6 Pacific, 9 Eastern. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're, uh, you know, taking drinks between the, uh, you know, free, Friday free for all, you know, and you want to learn about Minecraft, we're doing something tonight. Very, very cool. And of course, uh, John, also known as Suncast, you can follow him on Twitter at Suncast. Also, uh, he's on, um, he's on the Facebooks. I don't know if you accept friend requests on Facebook, but I know no. you are. Uh, but he's you already reached the 5,000 limit. I know. He's, he's, such, he's a, such a celebrity. John, you're such a celebrity. And of course, Amadeus, your website where you uh, discuss uh, m music and you, and you feature cover artists and cover songs. Of course, you can catch a link on our website when we post the show. And uh, the show is normally posted within 24 hours. So um, be sure to check it out on our website, gfknetwork.com. So let's get to the news, guys. And I know John is very excited about this. I am also excited and people don't understand why I'm excited about this. But I really like the new BlackBerry Z10 or Z10. 10 as they've been calling it <laughs> that so, so threw me off when i was reading or listening to some of the videos and he said z10 the, the, the uh, blackberry z10 such a poor choice you know what poor, it's, poor poor choice no i don't think it's that bad i actually like it i Rather like them to actually say z10 what does the z stand for it doesn't well, stand for anything they say z for. in like in canada and the uk so that's probably why no no, no but what UK, what is right? the z for i mean i understand like it's z10 or z10 but what is the purpose of the z well like high performance right so uh, you think okay. of like uh, camaro you know, uh, like z28 the z, 
Exactly. Yeah. And the Corvette, you know, the Z is like the high edition. It's 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 better. It's fuller. It's got more buttons. I, <laughs> I guess. Uh, the BlackBerry Z10 was officially announced this week. It's going to be featuring a 4.2 inch screen, 1280 by 768 display, 1.5 dual core snapdragon s4 plus it's going to have lte blackberry 10 and it's going to be 200 dollars. Uh, they also announced the uh another blackberry the q10 which is the official keyboard blackberry so i guess the the predecessor to the bold the blackberry bold i'm guessing i mean if you're going down the lineage of blackberry uh, people are very well, excited. What would about BlackBerry this. be without a QWERTY keyboard? Yeah, so. and let me tell you guys this. And the pr I, I've been we're going to get down to the specs, but I want your opinion on this. I, I was I was watching the news every morning. I turn on you know local news and I turn on CNN or Fox, whatever. And they were discussing the BlackBerry, and pe the the media is very excited about the BlackBerry. And I understand why. Most of them are using Blackberries currently. Uh, they like the QWERTY keyboard. Email is. Uh, great on a BlackBerry, so they're excited for it. But do you think the mainstream, the average user, is going to be excited for the BlackBerry? Are they going to go out and purchase a BlackBerry, or is this going to be a very isolated enterprise uh, thing that people are excited for? I'll go to John first because you're the one that knows about BlackBerry, and I really want to get your opinion too, Chase, on this because you're pretty much involved in every phone out there, and you kind of test them out. So I want to hear what you have to say. But John, what do you think? Well, this is very interesting because this is something that we've been looking forward to from BlackBerry for many years now. Because if you remember, they were pretty bad for a couple of years there. And, you know, this is something that they've delayed for a long time. And here it is. Finally, they announced it. And, you know, there's been so many leaks that we almost kind of knew everything before they even announced it. Uh, overall, I think it's a decent device. I'm just worried that it's not necessarily going to live up to expectations because this is something that's taken so long to bake, so long to come out, that the anticipation just kept growing. And so now that it is out, you expect it to be this amazing product because they have worked so hard. They've delayed it so many times that you expect it to be this phenomenal product, this supposed possibly, and I know you're going to hate that I use this term, uh, here we iPhone go. killer. Ugh, gross. But I think it's going to be a decent device. I don't think it's going to be a total hit because there's just going to be people that still don't like BlackBerry for whatever reason. Uh, I sort of fall into that boat myself, but at the same time, I'm I'm still open to BlackBerry. And I, this is definitely something that I want to try. How about you, Chase? What do you think? W wake me when this is over. You I really mean, you really hate the BlackBerry <laughs> stuff, huh? I don't I, I don't hate it, but it's I swear I think I was on this show about a year ago. When we were talking about BlackBerry and like 2012, this is it for BlackBerry. If they don't do something by the end of this year, we can kiss. I mean, we're, we can kiss them goodbye. And so now they make this huge announcement on a Friday, which, which typically, you know, these kind of announcements when they're released on a, you know, going into a weekend, sometimes it's done intentionally uh, because they hope people forget about it by Monday. It was I don't actually know. Wednesday. It was. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. I, I I'm. <laughs> Confusing my announcements, but it doesn't matter. Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. The, the thing is, a lot of businesses, yes, still use BlackBerry, you know, just because of the fact they love that BlackBerry enterprise server. It's very robust, does the job. Like you said, email, is, you know, it's the Cadillac of email phones. However, uh, a lot of companies, including my former company, were making the move from BlackBerry to iOS just because of the fact of, of apps and development. And there are so many things that they couldn't do on the existing BlackBerry platform. So unless they really wow their enterprise customers with this new phone, I, I think you're going to start seeing the beginning of the end. I mean, yeah. I mean, look what Palm did, and and uh, you know they had their big push uh, on phones and, and tablets, one big push, and then they were gone. But I think, I mean, in, in in all fairness, I think in in Palm's case. Um, and I think BlackBerry is benefiting, and we've kind of criticized BlackBerry for being so slow at at, at developing their next generation platform. But I think they're gonna they're gonna benefit from it because at the time when Black when Palm released the um, the Pre and WebOS, everybody was talking about the the iPhone killer, the iPhone killer. It's a different ballgame now. We don't need an iPhone killer. No, no. I think it really comes down to is the mainstream gonna accept it? Did, and how did good BlackBerry does it do enough? 
Did they do enough? I think they did something really good. Now, they have over 70,000 apps that they were talking about. Uh, but in this world where it's all about Android and it's all about the iPhone, even Windows Phone, which is a phenomenal system, has not been able to get any mainstream traction. Why is that? Is it because of the saturation that Android has in the market? Is it because people want to get an iPhone because they just want to get an iPhone and that's a safe Let choice? Let me ask you, how much do the apps play into this thing? Like, I, Obviously, apps do play a part into the, into the success of a platform. The question is, how much? If, if BlackBerry doesn't have a certain app, such as Instagram or Netflix, is that going to be the death of them? I think it's a 50-50 split. I, I think it really yeah. comes down to that. Um, I know a a very large portion of people that have iPhones that don't care about the apps. So is that the market that BlackBerry is going to get? I mean, again, how many apps do you really need? It's just a number, right? Unless uh, if you don't have the app that everybody wants, and it doesn't matter if you have 100,000 or 1,000 apps. Well, it's also it also comes down to usability. And you, you look, when, when iPhone came onto the scene and Apple introduced it, it revolutionized the way that smartphones are used and the whole, the whole nine yards, right? And so Android, you know, went off of that. And then you have Windows Phone come off of that and, and Palm and, and their OS coming off of that. So you got BlackBerry trying to do a complete refresh. And if you're a new user and a new customer, you've already seen your friends mess around with Android devices, Windows Phone devices, and iOS devices, and now you have BlackBerry trying to re revigorize themselves, if that's such a word, and um, what's to entice somebody to get that phone? I mean, now as a, as a tech person, and I see this, yeah, the, the, the specs look great. It's a beautiful looking screen. Maybe it's a little thicker. I really don't care, but what would entice? I mean, it's not just apps for me. I mean, it's. I also look at, will the platform have any legs? I don't want to yeah. invest in something if it's going to be gone in a year. And that's my fear with seeing this because it took them so long to push this out in the first place. John, do you think this is going to sell? It's so hard to tell because there's been a lot of mixed polls out there. Um, I, I saw a poll, I, and, and see, this is the thing, I just don't know how legitimate some of these polls are because they don't necessarily tell you uh, exactly how they conducted the poll. But one of these polls said that only one in eight people are actually interested in uh, BlackBerry Z10. But of course, this was before they even announced, announced BlackBerry Z10. So what does that tell you? Yeah, I mean, it's a high-res display. The, the, the only nail in the coffin that I see for this thing is the battery life. And already we've gotten really negative reviews as far as the battery life on this thing. And I know that they're testing it further here in the States with the carriers. And I'm wondering if they release it in the UK and they're releasing it in Canada as a... I guess, as a test bed to see how well it does with the battery life and how they could fix it. Because if the battery life is atrocious here in the States, this thing does not have a, a leg to stand on. I'm still very much worried about BlackBerry surviving because a lot of these reviews and everybody that's talking about that's try this, it's a mixed bag. There's just so much of the platform about BlackBerry 10 that is good, but then there's just so much of it that they haven't made good. And in a way, they need to hit this out of the park because this is just sort of their, their last-ditch effort at saving BlackBerry. And they haven't, I don't think, hit it out of the park. No. Uh, but are, again, it's a 1.0 device, right? Well, are they trying it to is, do so much? and that's something so much to, to be expected. What is that, Chase? Are, I was going to say, are they trying to do so much with this 1.0 release? They, they're, they're trying to hit it out of the park? They're, they're, I mean, obviously, look at the specs on the screen. Uh, they're, they're, and the, the processors that they're putting in this thing, they're obviously trying to make a huge push, but isn't going to be enough. I, I, I just don't see it. I could be wrong, but when you see BlackBerry losing market share month over month... It's a different age, too, because yeah. in a sense, when, when iPhone came out, nobody really expected much from the iPhone, so it was fine that it didn't have you know MMS and all these other features. Copy and paste. Whereas now... Yeah. This is something that we've come to expect from any phone, no matter how new it is. We expect them to have every single feature to be completely polished. And BlackBerry, I don't think, is polished. And that's not to say that it shouldn't be not polished or should be polished. It's just one of those things that comes with something that, because it's new, it's going to have these little quirks. 
But because it's BlackBerry, this is something that people have anticipated. They've ex anticipated them to actually have something that's going to wow them. But I just don't think that the wow factor is actually there. I mean, there's stuff that is amazing. BlackBerry Flow is amazing. I think some of the gestures that they've built into this is amazing. But there's other areas that, I mean, and one of them is apps. But there's not a whole lot BlackBerry can do other than, you know, throwing money at developers, which they've done to an extent. But then it's just up for the developers to go ahead and start making stuff for BlackBerry. I mean, I, I, I actually want to touch on the bigger story, and that's Alicia Keys being signed <laughs> as uh, she, she's a big shot in the company now. They, they, they are going to Alicia Keys as the global creative director. This is just another one of those stupid little marketing tricks that BlackBerry does I, that they think is so cool that yeah. thinks that it'll give them great marketing. If they say, oh, yeah, we're just going to say that this person is our ambassador or blah, blah, I, I blah. I hate that. I really do. And Chase, I know you probably dislike that, too. Intel did that with Will I Am, and, and I think yep. I think uh, BlackBerry also did that with Will I Am. So why go mm -hmm. to celebrities as a as a global creative director? I don't even know what the hell that means. They're, they're going for the kids, don't you see? They're yeah. going for the marketing. I mean, hello. I mean, Alicia Keys, New York. I mean... This Tall, girl is on fire. Woman. She's on fire. The company's on fire. This phone's going to be on fire. Of course, you got to get the kids in. And if it's so cool and hip to chat on your phone on your BlackBerry, hey, then kids might buy it. I mean, it's it's a tried and true method that co big companies will do uh, to try to get people to buy their product is get a celebrity on board. And obviously, Alicia, she's very popular uh, with the kids. And because uh, that's going to. Listen, I think I think uh, Microsoft was missing this with the kin. I think <laughs> Yo, if they had only gotten a celebrity <laughs> ambassador, they would have done great <laughs> with it. Uh, BlackBerry's also renamed the company. Rim, formerly known yes, as Rim, is, is now BlackBerry. Yep. Uh, Research in Motion is now BlackBerry, and I, I guarantee you, most people had no idea that the company's name was Rim. They probably yeah, had no idea. Well, we've we we actually you know we did an episode on one of my shows. Uh, we we had a play on words using Rim. I, I won't mention it here. Yeah. Everybody does. Uh, any, but, anybody that's ever talked about BlackBerry on a podcast it. has done that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah Microsoft. My, I stand correct. Microsoft has Gwen Stefani. That's right. But they didn't add her until they relaunched their Windows Listen. Phone over you know platform. Chase, I could be accused but, of a lot of things, but I ain't no holler back, girl. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely not. Uh, I do want to talk about. I want to. I'm going to jump around these notes a little bit because um, there's a lot to talk about. But I, we have a gaming story, Chase. Uh oh. And uh, you Just are you are the gaming expert, and I'm actually quite excited for this. And I want to know your opinion and what you think is going to happen. I know John is very excited about about the Sony announcement because he's a big yeah. gamer. Uh, yeah, yesterday, I'm fall asleep now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go. Yeah. You take your nap now. He I, Chase I, took yeah, his. I was taking the nap. Chase yeah. took his nap, and now you can take yours. Uh, yesterday, journalists received invitations for Stone, from Sony for a press conference event February 20th about the future of PlayStation. And there was this teaser video that they had uh, that pretty much showed nothing. It just yeah. the word Sony and the PlayStation logos uh, floating around the screen. Uh, Sony is trying to outdo Microsoft this year with their announcement of their next generation console. We saw Nintendo release the Wii U late last year. Now we're going to see Sony uh, probably announce the PlayStation 4, or whatever they're going to call it. Chase, what is some of your inside information on this? What, what, have, you, what, have, the, what have your leaks and what have your uh, tipsters told you about this? What I find very, very interesting is last week, Sony came out. Actually, maybe it was two weeks ago. I say this. Yeah, two weeks ago, Sony came out and said that they would not be announcing anything about their potential next-generation console until Microsoft does it first. Yeah. And, and now, all of a sudden, two weeks later, oh, uh, we have a, a very special meeting. You should uh, come on down. It's, it's related to PlayStation. Or, or is it? You know, they're flying logo. I mean, it was really, can I say Apple-esque-ish? Very Apple-esque. But, but yeah, I mean, very. the teaser was a little silly. Yeah, it, it, obviously they're 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 trying to build a little hype. The weird thing about it is the timing. Okay, he, mm -hmm. it's feb, uh, uh, you you're not going to make a preview console announcement in February when you're potentially going to be shipping uh, holiday season. Uh, the but, the big announcement's going to be probably at E three. E three, yeah, yeah. 
But so, I mean, but we've seen Microsoft pull away from yeah. that. We've seen, I, I mean, even Sony has kind of pulled away from E3. We're seeing everybody pull away from these big conferences. Maybe they're thinking yeah. they'll get more buzz if they announce it themselves. Well, that's the thing. A lot of companies are starting to do that. I mean, you, you see, I mean, not to turn this into a CES story, but you with Microsoft pulling out of CES and there, you know, there was no Microsoft presence at CES this year. You know, uh, some companies are thinking, well, we're, we're like Apple. We're big enough that we can do it on our own and have our own press conference and generate our own buzz. However, uh, what are they going to announce? And yeah. I, but what I don't can they announce, Chase? Right. What can what? they announce? I mean, it, it, we're talking from when did they announce? 2007 is when the PlayStation 3 came out? Yeah. So from 2007 to now, the, mm-hmm. the console as we know it, the, the, the iconic console where you put in a CD and you play your game on your TV, that is totally out the window. And Sony That's really true. fell behind. And Sony was not able to adapt with the times, with... Uh, with the, Xbox pretty much dominating it. And I know, listen, we're going to talk about the number of sales, you know, how many PlayStation sold. I think they're both almost equal. I think Sony is like 63 million units sold and uh, Microsoft is in the 70 million. So it's not that far off, but I'm really curious on how many of those Sony's are being used right now. I have a PlayStation 3. I bought it on release day. It's been sitting here. I, I probably played three games on it and it hasn't been turned on in years. So, I, I use my PS3 more for a movie console, uh, you know, Netflix, uh, and playing um, baseball video games on it. That's the only console that I really have games for. Um, I play almost my games either on the 360 or on the PC. I, so, I think, but you know, when you're talking yeah. about media consumption and what we have heard and kind of seen the leaked documents of the next generation Xbox, which will almost probably be called Xbox Surface. Uh, and by the way, I'm not. I'm not saying anything that hasn't been said. So I, I sometimes say these things and I get emails saying like, hey, did Paul tell you that? No, I'm, I'm just talking from what everybody knows. Uh, right. I really don't know if Sony will be able to survive because they don't understand user interface. Much like the Wii. The Wii U, in my opinion, which I own a Wii U, the user interface is a total mess. And I, John knows this. I've told John this a thousand times because he's heard me scream about it. They don't understand <laughs> how to do internet. They don't understand how to do uh, community. They don't understand they don't know how to do social. They don't understand how to do social. And you these have a friend are, code? Yeah. And these, are, <laughs> and these are things that are missing. And I don't, don't want to say it's a Japanese thing, but the culture's different. The way that they do software is totally different too, and we have not been able to see Sony or Nintendo catch up with the times because they don't understand software. Well, you look at like Microsoft's strategy uh, when it comes to the console, and obviously they they get it. Uh, they're they're turning the Xbox 360 into obviously a home entertainment piece, not just gaming, uh, but obviously community. You have all these. And they're they're bringing in quote unquote apps. You know, you have ESPN, you have Netflix, you have YouTube, you have Blip, yeah, of uh, Crunchyroll. You have all these apps, uh, and Amazon Prime included. All these different apps are plugging into the platform, uh, and the interface is pretty intuitive. It's pretty easy to get around. I know there's people that do complain about that interface as well, but I find it leaps and bounds better than the PlayStation 3. PlayStation 3 is a very mechanical kind of interface. Very mechanical. You're absolutely right. Very mechanical. Uh, very just text-based. So maybe what Sony is going to be announcing is not necessarily their new console, but maybe a, a new refreshed look at their whole uh, community experience. And I think you might have nailed it a little bit. They, they need to change their, their community aspect. Uh, it's very, very rough, and they need to put some polish on it. And maybe a good refresh before announcing their console, uh, their next console this summer, I think that'd be the way to go. And that's probably what they're going to do. They're going to have a little lead time for people to get excited about this new community aspect. And then a few months later, your console announcement. But I mean, this is, I can't remember the last time when you had two consoles come out around the same time. And I don't think that's necessarily good for either one of them. Well, Sega and Nintendo used to do that all the time. I did, um, was it was I mean, it a, was it the same time or was it like it was, a couple it months always, leading? It was always in the same season. So you would have Nintendo releasing and then maybe Sega releasing a couple of months later. Uh, the Game Wars are kind of back in a way where this next console that is released is going to set the benchmark for the next five to seven years for 
uh, you know, lean back gaming, if you will. And also, it's uh, going to set it's going to set a precedence on who controls your living room. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. I, I mean, these aren't. I I I, do, I cannot see the next generation console being something that you turn on and off when you need to use it. I think these are going to be things that are running all the time in your living room, and they kind of control your entire ecosystem in your living room. And, and yeah, it's very interesting. They just need to add home automation. That is what <laughs> they do need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have your Wii U and you have a touchscreen interface, right? So you can have your security all there. So you can like watch cameras in your own home. And Listen, know, I have a Wii U and yeah. uh, there's a couple stories that came out today. And I think the problem is that they, they, they've totally dropped the ball. Uh, they were supposed to have Google Maps on this thing and TiVo integration. And they've delayed it beyond January. Uh, it was supposed to come out this month, and there's no there's no sight on when they're going to do this. A is lot of the things, that, what is it like the Google Maps thing? Is that really important for you know what? It's not. It's not that it's important, but you these are things that were promised with this device, right. and it seemed like the it was a rushed thing. I, I feel like this the the Wii U was rushed, and there are a lot of things missing as far as uh, as far as tv integration goes with this i do yeah. and do you remember the big thing that we were going to get with the with the tvi yeah and we were yeah. going to get tv integration it's very half-assed i mean it's really really half-assed you got a tv guide and that's about it well, you can't watch part, your tv shows on there well part of the problem and you can't blame nintendo fully on this is the the content providers themselves i mean you see how closely protective they are of protecting now you know double under there, uh, protecting their existing model, uh, and and that is you know uh, the old school way of, of doing it. They they are very afraid of people not watching it through a normal cable box. Yeah. Uh, you, now Comcast and Verizon they've kind of relaxed it a little bit. Obviously, you can watch some Comcast stuff on your Xbox 360. You can watch some Verizon stuff on your 360. Um, you can't watch any TV content really on your on your PlayStation 3. And Nintendo's going through those growing pains right now trying to integrate providers. And so I think that's the problem. I, I, I don't know if you can totally pin this on Nintendo. Maybe they bit off more they can chew when they said, oh yeah, we're going to have this you know, TVI and you're going to be able to watch TV right on your Wii U. And, and all of a sudden they ran into all these big American companies and yeah. conglomerates trying to protect themselves. Well, also, you know, one thing that we're, we're totally forgetting is these, I, I think this year we're going to see, and next year too, we're going to see these uh, you know, HDMI thumbstick consoles yep come out and we're and we're seeing more and more of these uh we're going to have uh we're going to have a PC gaming on on your TV we're going to have steam. we're going to have steam we're going to have the uh the android consoles that are going to be coming out so th there's a lot of competition to be in your living room i don't know if there's going to be one dominant one but you know what if one guy's going to be able to pull it off i pr it's probably going to be microsoft cuz they understand user interface how many times did microsoft change their xbox interface from the time a lot. from the beginning to now i mean it's been like every every year and a half they've done some sort of tweak how many times can you say that sony has changed their interface no i you're right and not only that but how many times have we probably commented on the xbox 360 on the interface and be like, wow, this is really good. Why can't Windows be like this? Or why can't something that Microsoft makes on another system be like this? Uh, and uh, yeah, you're, you're right. And, and the thing is, with all these new consoles coming out down the road and uh, smaller consoles and NVIDIA's getting involved with it as well, and Steam, you mentioned it, I don't think it's just going to be one dominant player in the living room. Uh, I think you're, there's room for a couple. Uh, but that's it. I mean, it's all d d based upon the price point, really. Yeah. Uh, if you can get a small little, you know, Android console for a hundred bucks, and you pick up, you know, your big main console, say your PlayStation Four, or your Xbox, whatever, whatever, uh, for five hundred bucks, okay, I can do that. But I'm not going to pick two. Well, I am, but the typical person's not going to get, you know, the both main consoles probably. Yeah. So uh, Sony's announcement February twentieth. We're going to see what it is. Um... I'm hoping they they kind of step their game up because I like I like the yeah. heat of competition. I like the fact that these companies go back and forth, and some people pick a side. <sighs> We're not going to get the Nintendo Sega wars, but uh, maybe we'll I come close that. to it. I do too. I miss Sega. I I really wish. I mean this this is a great year. I mean this is going to be a great year for gamers uh, of all types, not just console, but handheld, uh, uh, casual gamers, everybody. It's going to be a good year for that. 
Uh, but man, there's something about not having Sega still not making a console. I still feel the Dreamcast was a great console. It got blown away by the PlayStation. Listen, 2, the Dreamcast but, was. Uh, um, I absolutely loved the Sega Dreamcast. I, I had the thing that killed them was the, the Xbox. And yeah, it was Sony and also EA. Lack of EA support. Lack of EA support, um, and I think piracy yeah. also was running. Oh, that was huge. <laughs> rampant on that thing because it was super, still super, super games easy. For it. Are they really? You can, yeah, in, in Japan, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe like one or two releases a year. Uh, nothing major, but and uh, they're like third-party independent developers. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's still a very, very popular platform. Absolutely. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, first console to have a, a dedicated modem, uh, 56K modem. First and it console. ran Windows. It was running Windows. It, Windows CE, yeah. And it also had a, uh, you can get a broadband adapter. And uh, it was the first major console with the the first party Sega Sports, you know, the 2K Sports, where it was really fighting uh, EA as far as quality on sports games. So a lot of innovative stuff. It's sorry to see them go, uh, but uh, you could still play some of their awesome games on other consoles. Like uh, the Sega All-Stars Racing is really good. Uh, so there's some good stuff out there from them. Very cool. Uh, we're going to see what happens. Now, I want to talk yep. about this next story. Uh, Apple is releasing a 128-gig iPad starting at $799. This is closing the gap between uh, you know, the storage on a traditional laptop and the storage on a tablet. 128 gigs on an iPad. I have a 16-gig iPad, and I don't even fill it up on this thing because everything I do is pretty much on the cloud now. Uh, yep. 799 Wi-Fi only model. It's 829, so it's almost a thousand dollars. You're getting closer to a MacBook Air price in that category. Uh, it's going to be available February 5th. John, what do you think of these th this device being released now? It's a little weird for Apple to push push this out now. Very unlike Apple to do it. Huh? What? Yeah. <laughs> Wake up, John. <laughs> Wake up, John. We're, we're talking about Apple now. We're back. We're back oh, yeah, to stuff. Yeah. Well, my question is: Is this something that they're doing to try to compete with the Microsoft Surface Pro, which is also 128 gigabytes? Mm. Is this something that they're trying to do to make the iPad more appealing to those in the enterprise world that might want to be looking at tablets now that there's there's more options out there than just the iPad? And they undercut app. They undercut Microsoft on the pricing too on this thing. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think necessarily the people going and buying a Surface Pro are going to be tempted by a 128 gig iPad. I think if they were going to get an iPad, they would have bought it by now. Uh, I think the Surface Pro is appealing to somebody totally different. But yeah, in a way, it, it they are trying to undercut them. I, I I'm I find it bizarre that they've they're, they're releasing it now, considering we've heard rumors about a iPad 5 coming out in March, being announced in March. Uh, what are they going to do with their cycle? It's really sh weird because they just announced two months ago a new iPad. This is the the crazy thing about Apple is that you just never know what they're going to do. And on top of that, you always have these rumors. There's there's never not a rumor about Apple, especially the iPad or iPhone. There's always rumors going about those two devices, and it's just there's just no telling if that's true. I mean, it, it's Apple. It could be true. I mean, this is fascinating. Now you're starting to see the, see the difference between Tim Cook's guidance of Apple and Steve Jobs. Tim Cook seems to be a lot more reactionary when it comes to the way he does products. And we've seen that happen with the iPad mini. We've seen it happen with releasing a fourth generation iPad out of the blue around the same time that uh, the Surface was coming out. We're seeing it now with a 128 gig iPad. Uh, rumors are coming out that we're going to see lower end iPad, uh, iPod, iPhones. The third gen doesn't exist anymore. The third gen, yeah, they just eliminated it. We have a <laughs> iPad gone. 2 on the market that's two years old now compared to what's on the market. It's it's a little bizarre, Chase. What, what do you make of this? This is very reactionary. Very. Uh, I think you hit it you perfect because look at their stock price right now. Uh, my my, my co-host on, on the Minecraft show, uh, he owns stock, uh, Joe, and uh, I don't know if he's panicking. Um, but he he got had the stock since he was a kid, so you know it's like his retirement thing. I tell him just leave it alone, don't worry about it. Uh, this 128 gig thing, this is really only for uh, I think obviously the enterprise people, but also for people that are doing a lot of video on on their iPads, you know, holding it up at press conferences and such, <laughs> you know, and, and taping things. 
very reactionary. And uh, they're trying to do something. And I also thought about the whole Surface thing, the Surface Pro, and maybe they're trying to combat that. Maybe they feel a little threatened by that. Apple's never done that before in the past. They've never been reactionary. They've always been on the forefront, like, we don't care what everybody else is doing. But this does feel very reactionary. It is. And and you're looking at a, at a stock that in September was $700 yep. a share, and now it's $435. So there's a significant drop in the Apple stock. And you know what? It, it, I think it plateaued. I, I think it, it hit its, its a peak. It's weird that they have all these different models or products now, product lines with different models per line. Yeah. Not just like one or two. They've got like four or five. Well, they've kind of gone backwards, right? This is what Steve Jobs did not want. He he didn't want there to be 500 products of the same thing. We have for the before it was simply MacBook Air. You had the higher end MacBook Air and the lower end. And then you had MacBook Pro and you had a higher end and a lower end for each size. Now it seems yeah. like there's Retina, there's non Retina, there's the new gen, there's the old gen. There's the mini, there's the iPod Touch, there's, there's too the many. iPhone. You know, Here's one thing that they don't have. And uh, John, you, you probably remember we were talking about this on my show. They don't, so uh, they have MacBook Airs, they have MacBook Pros, they have this decent laptop line. Then when you go to the desktop world, you have the mm -hmm. Mac Mini, okay? You have an iMac, which has a built in screen. And then you have the three to $4,000 Mac Pro. What if I want a desktop system that has a decent power under the hood? But I can't afford to pay for a $4,000 Mac Pro. Where's my options? They have all these options in the, in the portable arena, iPads and iPhones. They have all these different options, but uh, nothing in the desktop area. Maybe they need to kind of refocus a little bit and not worry about too much about one segment of their product line. Well, I guess I it's a Mac Mini, right? The, their thing is, well, if that's what you want, you're going to buy a Mac Mini because you can no, get it with an i7 now. Yeah, but but what if I? What the thing is? I don't the, think I don't think a, a, a Mac work. Mini fulfills that sort no. of need as as what me and Chase are looking to do. But what are you looking to do? Give me an example. Uh, I I want to I want to do some uh, Apple ProRes codec editing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to plug in a Blackmagic uh, Intensity Pro. Okay. Can't do that there. Go I would buy have a to Mac Pro. The they want you to go buy a Mac Pro. That's, but I I there's needs to be a middle ground there. There's no middle ground, and no wonder why there's this uh, thriving community of people who are doing Hackintoshes, uh, because, I mean, right now, I mean, here's the other thing. They haven't refreshed the Mac Pro in, what, two and a half, two three and a half, years? Two and a half, three years. Okay, you can get a Thunderbolt port on a MacBook Air and a MacBook Pro, but if I go, uh, but if I go buy a Mac Pro, it doesn't have a Thunderbolt port. It doesn't even have a USB 3. Well, the reality is, I mean, that's not going to sell, right? And it's not a sexy device, and... Apple's whole thing is this sex factor to them, and and you yeah. you want it because it's pretty and it's sleek and it's aluminum and oh my god, look how nice this looks, and that's why you go and you pay the premium and you buy a Mac product. Yeah, but there's a segment though. I mean, there's a segment there for, is, for sure. people that that need that. You know, like uh, video editors like myself and and John. You know, we know mm -hmm. we're producing shows and we're putting stuff together. You know, we want that technology. We want a twelve core system. But that's not that's not dated two and a half three years ago. There's a segment for that. Now, if if Apple if Apple said, you know what, go ahead install our our operating system on non licensed hardware, and they would sell the operating system separately and support that community, then I wouldn't be talking right now. But you know what? They, I don't think I don't think that's far from happening. Well, we've talked about that years ago, and you know it always comes up at least once a year. Maybe they'll do that. And I mean, listen that, now. Okay. If you asked me two years ago, would Apple do that? I probably would have said no. But now mm -hmm. it's a whole different world, and Apple is doing these weird reactionary decisions. That's an impulse decision, and I don't think it's very strategic on Apple's on, on yeah. Apple side. I don't necessarily agree with the fact that they have three phones on the market, and each of them are totally different. You have the four, you have the four S, and you have the five. I, I don't, don't even like offer that. the four. I don't think. I, yeah. I just don't understand why they still do. And, and because. And, I mean, you can find 4Ss for $99. Why do you need a 4? And I'll tell you something. Yeah. And the same problem with the iPad, where initially they're like, well, you could buy the older iPad or the newer one. Okay, that was fine. But now it's not. that's not the case. It's not a older iPad or a newer iPad. It's the oldest iPad that's cheap for us now for you to go and buy for $399. Or you could buy the new one for $499. The experience that you're getting on the iPad 2 compared to the iPad 4 
is night and day. Apple's yeah. own apps are awful. When they upgraded to the latest version of iOS, you, my experience with the App Store, with the uh, with iTunes and the podcasting app are atrocious. It's super slow. It's super sluggy. It doesn't run the same way. And app, this is Apple's way of kind of forcing you to go buy the new one. That's fine. I understand that. That's what everybody does. But you can't still sell the piece of crap on the market. The experience, I'm telling you right now, and I'm calling it a piece of crap because I was trying to download an app and it would lock up and I have two iPad 2s. One for my you wife's job. You to get one. Well, no, one for my wife's job that they gave her <laughs> and one on mine. So I initially thought it was mine because it was getting a little full and I had the same experience on my wife's iPad too. So it, it's something that they're doing. It's, it's slower and the hardware is older and it can't run it. But what happens when you do this is that the user is not going to be able to understand and be like, oh, well, you know what? I got the iPad too. So yeah, the experience is not going to be like the new iPad. They're going to be like, wow, this is a piece of crap. It doesn't work right. Well, they feel that they, they need to have a low entry point for users to get involved with. I think and that's fine. If, I think that's fine. Non-retina and retina, yeah. that's all. Yeah. And, and, and not have so many different options. I mean, and, and I don't know if you've been, been looking at the, the news and the reports with uh, you know, rumors of the 5S and this like new lower cost iPhone. I saw that. I mean, it's like, But at okay. the same time, they're also talking about the larger iPhones. Yeah, like 128 gig iPhone as well, right. So it's just like are they are they panicked a little bit because they see how well Android's doing and how Windows Phone is slowly making a little market share? But, I mean, you know, are they just but, freaking out? But I think they're freaking out for for the wrong reasons. When you yeah. and and the story was and I saw everybody gloating about this. Oh yeah, Samsung is kicking Apple's ass. Samsung is doing so much better. You give me one Samsung phone against the iPhone and you tell me what the numbers are like. Now, wait a minute. I just saw a story that said Apple is number <laughs> 1 in terms of handset sales. And Samsung is now number two. It's going to go back and forth, but I the true comparison is <laughs> you take you take a iPhone five, okay, and you compare it to the latest Samsung flagship phone, which is the what is it the 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 S3 Samsung S three S three or the S yeah. four that's going to be coming out, and you do a comparison and you tell me what the sale numbers are. I guarantee the iPhone is going to be better. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that's just how it is. You can't compare. Well, 500 Samsung phones to the three Apple phones. And listen, I'm not here to defend Apple. I'm just, I just want a fair comparison. Yeah, but, but what you're not taking into account, Andrew, is the, uh, the, ben the pent up demand for an Apple device. For example, you had a number of people that had iPhone 4s that didn't do the upgrade at the 4S because they knew that the next one would be the big upgrade to get. So there's always this pent up demand. Uh, uh, when this new phone comes out. Now, Samsung, they have a different strategy. What they're doing is as soon as they can put together uh, a phone that is you know, maybe 25 to 50% better than the previous phone, it's they're out. pushing it out. Yeah. And, and That's they're, why they're, they have 20 versions of the Galaxy right. Nexus S. Yeah. Exactly. So, so they're pushing out. Which is so out, annoying. I hate that. Yeah, it's very annoying. But Every then six again, months, they have a new Galaxy S. But then again, they're making... They're making uh, phones for pretty much every single carrier out there, and now Apple's starting to have to do that as well. You know, with their yeah. their agreements with Sprint, Verizon, and AT and T, and they have all these other smaller carriers out there. No, I, I think Apple's trying to say, well, man, we're seeing what Samsung's doing. We're, we're seeing all these other companies what they're doing. We need to kind of make a change, and maybe they're being reactionary, and it may cost them. Who knows? Maybe I, maybe I think it is. Best thing. I know. I yeah. think I think it is going to cost them because the, the whole thing about the iPhone. The reason why the iPhone has been good is because the user experience on the iPhone is very high. It's very positive. The user experience on an iPhone. It's very simplistic to understand, and that's my father. Which uh, he's for years. He's had a regular flip phone. I got him an iPhone 4s. He absolutely loves it. He's taking pictures. He's going on uh, Facebook now on this thing. And this is a guy that didn't understand this stuff. Same thing with the iPad. He's able to understand it. And Apple is very good at that. But yeah. when you start diluting the user experience with lower end phones running on this thing, it's not going to be the same. And you're going to start running into trouble. I, that's my opinion. Listen, people could people are going to probably be like, you're wrong. The more, the better. I don't necessarily think that's the case. I yeah. think it's quality over quantity. And Apple is reacting to what the tech pundits are saying when they write, Samsung is beating Apple. Well, the one thing... It's not a fair comparison. One thing you were saying is about user experience. And like, for example, if you got a, an Android phone, there are some Androids out there 
that are running, what, five or six or seven versions behind. Yeah. Um, the one thing that you could always count on with Apple, and you're starting to experience it, as you mentioned in your example, where now, if you inst- when you installed an app, you knew it would work no matter what, what hardware device you had. If you had a 4 or a 4S or a 3GS, you knew that the app would, would install no problem, just fine. But now they're becoming so fragmented and having more and more devices out there, what you got going on here is the user experience is going to begin to suffer a little bit, yeah. and that's going to push people frustrated, and they're going to look for other options. John, you want to uh, talk about the path story? Because I found this fascinating. Yeah, this is really interesting. Um, path is a like a social network kind of company. Um, let me bring up some of the details here so I, I have them right in front of because me. Because I'm not a Path um, user, and um, I know a I lot of people I never was are. either, but apparently they were, uh, like a year ago, they came out with an iOS app that, you know, unbeknownst to anybody that used it, was collecting their information, was going into grabbing their entire address book and sending it back to the company without anybody ever knowing. And so I guess uh, the FCC, was it the FCC? No, it's the FTC. FTC. Excuse me. FTC has um, filed suits against them, and so now they owe the FTC $800,000 for the violation of uh, not only violating user privacy, but there's also this uh, claim that they violated Children's Online Privacy Protection Act by allowing, um, by asking children to do something without their parents' acknowledgement. Mm. I mean... Uh- Path is just one of the companies that got caught, and I say this every week. And John, you know my my spiel on this. How many of these apps that we're installing, you know, smaller apps that we they're not they're not funded by a big company. We're installing these no name apps on these Android phones on iOS, and we don't know what the hell they're doing with our information. And you know, know the ironic or the actually funny part of this story now what? is that mm. just today it came out that this same company, this same application, is supposedly also tracking your location. Even if you have the location services turned off for the application, but didn't we? Didn't I? Didn't we talk about this last week? But like with this hypothetical app that I created in my head. Well, this is something that you always have to worry about with with these mobile applications now, because we take our phones with them with us everywhere, and, and we just don't really give these things a second thought. Uh, Jace, do you think about it when you're installing apps on your phone? Because you know what, I complain about this, but I'm responsible for that too. I don't read the terms of service. I don't do any of that. Well, I, I'm very, I'm a little careful. On like, if I'm seeing if any of my other friends are on like that particular service, I've used Path. Um, and I, did I read the official terms of service? No. Uh, but I always, the way I look at it is, you know, you, you, you know, you're at your own risk, I guess. Uh, I'm always, I'm careful. But some, some apps, I'm just like, well, if they're doing it, I'm probably doing it. Eh, what's it gonna hurt? I guess I don't know. It doesn't really bother me all too much. I I just want to know if they're holding on to it secretly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and what they're doing with my data. Um, I'm I'm very particular, especially when it comes to Facebook. You know, having my privacy settings set up and stuff. But I mean, there's a lot of apps that you may download on your phone, and just by the act of installing it, they're getting information. Mm-hmm. And those and it's not those only the, that, those, but they could yeah. also come out with an update that does something that you're not even aware of. So that you may read through the terms of service, but you know they could come out with an update and change their terms of service without you ever knowing. Well, I figure if it's something that's really, really bad, we're going to hear about it anyway. I mean, like we did with the whole Instagram debacle, um, you know, where people were all freaking out because they thought Instagram was you know, going to steal their pictures and call them their own and stuff. And you, know, you, you heard about that big turmoil with that. So... I figure if something gets really, really bad, like this path situation, then uh, we'll hear about it. Otherwise, I don't. I don't stress too much on that. I don't know. I just I, whatever I do on the internet, I pretty much know that it's going somewhere. So I'm pretty good about you know not putting stuff <laughs> yeah. that I don't want out in there. Uh, I, I'm pretty careful about it, but we'll see what happens, uh, guys. It is time for picks of the week. Actually, no. One, one more story, and I know John is very excited for this. <laughs> this is yeah. the story for John. Which one? Uh, GoDaddy Super Bowl ad has supermodel oh, Bar one. Raphael making out with <laughs> nerds. Yeah. Now, uh, you're very. How excited are you? Did about you this? watch the video for this? No, I haven't. 
Oh my god! And you, I don't want to. I don't want to. Cannot appreciate this story until you've actually seen the video. For I, this. I don't want to play it on the air because I know for a fact. <laughs> don't go, Daddy. Don't, don't play flag it on the this. air because if people really want to see it, they can go see it on their own. Yeah. So uh, pretty much, I could I could describe it. It's it's a nerdy guy making out with a supermodel, <laughs> and the guy is really blotchy and he has rosacea. I'm guessing. This uh, is the guy face. that you see in all those movies as the geeky extra guy that you've seen a million times on like shows like Glee. Yeah, it's well, this, that guy. You know what? This guy, I give him, he for the rest of his life, he's gonna be able to be like, I made out with Bar Raphael. I could, I did it's it. It's just all kinds of awkward too. I don't know if he was trying to purposely be awkward or if that just really was. It's very uncomfortable to watch. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like you're 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 going into the fantasy. Uh, of of something and it's it's reality. It's I'm going, real. I'm go, you know what I'm doing? I'm yeah. going into John's uh, brain, and that is uh, like that is not where I want to be. Yes, I don't want to be you're there either. John in that situation. That's what you're doing. Yeah. And then he but what do you up. expect from a company like GoDaddy that does this sort of stuff? But yeah. I do have to say, you know what? Danica Patrick looks pretty good all cleaned up. I like hey. her. I hey, like I Danica. I will say this. I mean, you got you you, you whether you hate or or like GoDaddy. They're they're playing with the same thing that is, hey, we're going to put hot girls on TV during the Super Bowl or or any other time of the year, and uh, we're going to get you to talk about us, whether you hate us or like us, and it's working. We're talking about them. Uh, and Kind of like know, a shock jock. Yeah, hey. Hey, now. There you go. Hey, now. All right, guys. Um, <laughs> hey, now. Hey, now. Hey, now. All right, let's do our picks of the week. This is the portion of the show where we discuss uh, a tech product, a tech website, anything that has to do with technology that uh, we like or we discovered this week. John, why don't you go first? All right, so I, I don't have a great pick. Well, it's a great pick, but it's just something that, you know, if you're an iPhone user or an iOS user, this is something that you, you probably already know well about is the Gmail application. If you have an iOS device... And you also have a Gmail account. Don't even bother with the n native mail client. Get the Gmail app because it is just all kinds of awesome and so much better than the native mail client on iOS. What it does is that it's basically Gmail. Like everything you would want from Gmail, it does. Not only that, but it is so much better because it has push notifications, which is something that you don't get if you set up your Gmail account with the native ma mail app. I think you can do it, but it just... It's really hard to configure it to, for, for push email. And then you don't even get all the, you know, extras such as starring email or archiving email or uh, being able to search your, your mail that you have archived. That's what this Gmail app does. It does all of that, and it also has multi-account support. So if you have more than one Gmail account, you can add up to five accounts, which is so awesome because I, I definitely have about five different Gmail accounts myself. So this is great. I can add all of those and get notifications, push notifications for all of my accounts. You can send and receive attachments, organize your mail by archiving and labeling or star starring and deleting and reporting spam. Um, it has great Google Calendar and Google Plus integration with it. It will auto-complete your contact names as you type them. It will read your mail with threaded conversations. You will also see profile pictures, and it's just it's so good. It's such a better experience than using the native mail app. So if you have a Gmail account, definitely get the Gmail app for iOS, and it's completely free. Very, very cool, John. Uh, Chase, what is your yes. pick of the week? Well, you know, I've been doing a lot of shopping lately uh, because of studio upgrades, and uh, you always want to make the, the best deal online. Now, uh, John had a, had a great pick a week or two ago about when you, you know, go into Amazon and, or you know, some popular website, and it tells you if there's a better deal somewhere else. I have a, a, a really cool... Now, this is only for Chrome. I don't know if it's available for Firefox, but I believe it's a Chrome-only extension at this point. And it's called Honey. And what is really cool about this extension is it will automatically search through discount codes at checkout before you check out to see if it can find you the best deal. So, for example, let's say that you're heading over to GoDaddy and you're registering a domain since we were just talking about them. And right, bef right at the checkout, there's that coupon uh, field. Well, this, uh, this extension will have a button that you can click on. And then what it will do is it will scan through its database of codes. 
Uh, some sites have 10, 20, 30. It will go through all of them. And then what will happen is it will find you the best one and use it, and you can use it, and you could save money on whatever you're using. Now, uh, they're not available for a lot of websites, but the most popular ones like Amazon, Macy's, Best Buy, things like that. That's really cool, it's actually. It's absolutely free. I looked into their terms of service because I was very interested if they were getting a kickback on, on the codes, on the sites that you're using, and, the, and they're not. Uh, they do use Google Analytics to track how much you're using it and things like that, uh, but they're not taking a cut of the sale or anything. So if you're using, say, the GFQ link when you're doing shopping at Amazon, GFQ is still going to get credit for the sale. Uh, part of that proceeds will help support them, and you'll save money uh, if there's a coupon that works. Um, I really like it's, that. It's automatic, and it's I love it. It's great. And uh, I mean, I was registering some domains the other day, and I had a code. And I usually would go to retailmenot.com, which is a nice website for that. But this is automated. You just click it. It scans. It says, ah, this is the best code, and gives it to you. Very cool pick, actually. I'm going to install this on Chrome right now. Yeah, it's great. I yeah, very it. useful. Uh, thanks. thanks, Chase. Uh, my pick sure. of the week this week, uh, in, in um, I don't know if you guys saw the news yesterday, but stickem.com is uh, no longer around. They, they closed I'm, up. I'm sorry. Uh, we have I'm been sorry. using, I know, I know. We're mourning here at the network. Uh, we, we were on Stickem for a long time, and they were a big supporter of our network. And uh, the reason why we liked it so much is because of the built-in community. And for any up-and-coming internet broadcaster, it, it, it goes a long way when you have a built-in community on the website that you're using to kind of help get your name out there. And, you know, we, we're on JTV and we're on Ustream and we're on Bamboozer and we're on a bunch of other sites. But Stickham, we, we always made it our primary service because of how loyal they were to us. So it, we were sad to hear that they, they, uh, they closed up. But uh, over the week, I was searching for... Another site, something similar to it, another CDN that does high quality HD video uh, that could support having multiple people watch, has a decent player where you don't have these like crazy like buttons popping up, and something that I discovered is called Vaughn Live. Now, um, I wasn't familiar with this until uh, over the weekend. Somebody sent me a link to Vaughn Live. It's still in beta. They're still working out a lot of the kinks, but I have to tell you, and I'll, and I'll pull it up here. The video looks phenomenal on this. I'm on the Vaughn Live website. Nice, clean player. Uh, you could you have a chat room next to it if you decide to use it. Uh, it's a very nice website. I mean, it, it's it's easy to use. Uh, they have a nice little community that goes along with it, so you get some built-in traffic. So I kind of want to recommend this for the internet broadcasters and the people that are streaming their content yeah. live on the internet. Uh, it's called Vaughn Live. Uh, v a u g h n Live TV is the website. They're still in beta, and I was told they're going to be doing some major changes in the upcoming weeks. So, uh, you know, keep your eye open and, and take a look at it. But I, I think it's a cool little pick. I know, Chase, you're probably going to go check it out because you're always looking for, for another service. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, we have a great relationship with Twitch. Uh, but uh, with the new upgrades, I'm looking to spread the wings and go into other CDNs. And uh, this sounds really cool. I can't wait to check it out. Actually, uh, one of the one thing, and I, and I kind of to credit the, the developers over there. They've done a good job. John is very critical on players, uh, mm -hmm. and because he does a lot, he does all our website work, and he really, you're not a fan of the couple of plays. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bash him. But there's another service that we use that we don't really embed on our website, and the player does something weird with like a like button, and it and it overlaps, and it doesn't really function well on our website. When you looked at their play, you're like, wow, you know what? This is actually pretty nice. And for John to say that, it. yeah, and for John to say that, you know, it goes a long way. So, uh, guys, you're doing a good job. I, I wanted to give you guys a little shout out and uh, a nice looking site. And, and hopefully, you know, it'll continue to grow uh, now that um, Stickem is dead. Long mm. uh, rest in peace, Stickem. All right, guys, <laughs> uh, time to wrap it up. <laughs> uh, time to wrap it up. Uh, go to our website, gfqnetwork.com. If you miss any portion of this site, of the show, I should say. I'm looking at the website, so I'm saying site. Uh, you could also follow us on Twitter, GFQ Network on Twitter. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash guys from Queens. You can follow me personally on Twitter, at Andrew Zarian. Chase, thank you yes. so much for joining us today. Oh, it's been far too long. It's great uh, always being on, and uh, we always love having you on our show as well. It's always a, always a great time. Thanks. Appreciate at, it. At Nunes on Twitter. Also, Geek Gamer uh, TV is on Twitter as well. Geek Gamer Weekly is the show. Sundays, 9 p.m. East. Also, uh, Minecraft no, 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 Me. No, 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 it's, it's 9 p.m. Pacific. No, my, no 9 p.m. East. 
Uh, it's Geek Gamer Weekly Sundays, 9 e 6 p.m. West, and Minecraft Me is typically Thursday evenings, 9 p.m. Uh, West, 12 midnight east. Yes. Uh, John. Amadeus. Yep. Uh, where people could go and check out all things uh, music covers. Music covers. You make a lot of posts. YouTube a lot of music covers. A lot of great There's stuff. so many great artists on there. Yeah, I was on there. I was on there yesterday. Actually, I was I was uh, futzing around on your website, as they say here in New York, <laughs> and uh, I found some really good covers. And I was listening to them. Oh God, this is really cool. Um, also, it's uh, stuff that that yeah. should be on the radio. It should be, yeah. And also, you can follow uh, John on Twitter at Suncast. He's on Twitter. Go hand him. Go go ask him questions about the GFK network. He'll tell you how miserable he is here. <laughs> yeah, I'm a slave. <laughs> yeah, he's a slave. In he's in my now, John. After you finish up, make sure you lock the door, okay? Do I have don't, to? Yes, don't you have to lock to the basement the door. You have to don't forget to turn on the sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to lock the basement door. I don't want you coming up here in the middle of the night, walking All around right. looking for for cheese. He has this weird thing about cheese. I don't understand why. All right, guys, we'll see you all next week on Tech News Weekly. Good night. News Weekly. Good night.